Can we thank God for our pastors today? Aren't we blessed? Man, you're looking good in the house of the Lord. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, you're looking good today. I'm glad you showered. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord and excited about what God is doing in our church. Really excited about the message that God's laid on my heart today. And uh, how many of you came ready and expecting to hear from God today? Anybody ready for that? Yeah. You know, I heard about this couple from Minneapolis that um, decided that they wanted to get away from the icy cold weather, decided that they were going to plan a trip to Florida. And so they, they, they planned their trip, but unfortunately they were unable to coordinate their schedules. And so the husband left uh, on Thursday and then his wife decided that she would join him the next day. And the husband checked into the hotel, got settled in, and noticed that there was a computer in the room and decided, I'm going to send my wife an email before she gets here. And so he, he decides to send an email. However, he misses a letter in her email. Anybody ever done that? And, and he misses a letter and something happens because, uh, meanwhile, somewhere in Houston, a widow had just returned home from her husband's funeral. He was a Baptist minister and had been called home to glory, and the widow decided she was going to check her email expecting to get some condolence messages, and this is what she got. To my loving wife, I've just arrived today. I know you're surprised to hear from me, but they have computers up here now, and I can send you an email. And since I've just arrived, I thought I would send you an email, but everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. Looking forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey is as uneventful as mine. P.S. It sure is hot down here. I don't know about you, but that's not the email I want to get when I'm heading to eternity. Amen. I believe that today God has a word for us, and I just want to share something from my heart. You know, growing up, I always felt called and led to be an architect. I loved going around big buildings and big cities where I could see the design and the architecture of buildings. There was something that I was fascinated about when it came to design. And, and growing up, I had all these aspirations of doing that, but, but lo- along the way, I kind of figured out really quickly that that wasn't the call of God on my life. That I wouldn't be designing buildings, I wouldn't be building and, and crafting things, but, but God quickly let me know that I would be building and helping people design and craft their lives as they follow Jesus. That maybe I wouldn't be an architect of buildings, but I would help people be the better architect of their lives. And I, I think what's so significant that me and you have to understand today is just as I desire to be an architect and a designer is that you and I serve the great architect and designer. His name is God. And today he is the great creator. But not only is he an architect and a designer, but he's also an author. Somebody say an author. And there's none better than God himself. And I want to let you know that today God has been writing your story long before your story ever began. That there is a book with your name on it in heaven where God has your life and your plan laid out long before you ever were even uh, thought of. Long before your mom and dad had their first milkshake together. That God had a plan for your life, that he is the one who has been writing your story. Why? Because God is an author. And, and, And God gives us snapshots along the way of what has been written in our book. And today we're going to simply talk about praying our book. Why? Because there's been a book with your name on it written in heaven. Anybody thankful that long before your existence God thought about you? Long before you were in your mother's womb, God was thinking about you. He wanted to provide a snapshot of your future. In Psalm 139, verse 16, it says it this way. It says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life. Somebody say every day. Every day, this is significant, of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Now, I could just stop right here, and honestly, I could preach the rest of the message without giving you any other points, only because you need to understand, if you maybe feel like God has forgotten about you, 
Maybe you feel like you're insignificant to God. I want to let you know that he not only planned out your days, but he knows the very number of hairs on your head today. And maybe you feel like he's forgotten you. I feel like preaching because I ain't preached in a while. Is that okay if I preach today? Listen. That God had a plan for you so much so that when one hair falls out of your hair, and some of, somebody this morning got a shower and several of them fell out. Some of you men say amen to that. You're the one that has to unclog the drain. Amen. And God would take notice of you, and no matter what you may feel about the distance of God today, he's closer to you than he's ever been. That he would take into account every day of your life long before it would happen. God's intricately aware that your days were written, your steps were ordered, your hairs were numbered. But if you're sitting in this room today, one thing you must understand is that what has been written in heaven has to come to earth. What good is it if your story is in heaven, but it never happens here on earth? I often wonder about people who they're laying on their deathbed and they're questioning, why did I not do this? And why did I not do that? And why did I miss this opportunity? And why did I not have that conversation? Can I tell you today that God has laid all of those things out long before you ever existed? And what he doesn't want is for you to lay on that deathbed asking those questions. But God's got a purpose for you. Somebody say, God's got a purpose for me. God's got such a purpose for you that he would lay this out in such a way that he would say, I've written it in heaven, but I want to get it down in the earth. And here's our challenge today. Our challenge is simply this, is how do we get what's written in heaven to happen on the earth? How do we get that down here? Because ultimately, our prayer has to be, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, what? On earth as it is in heaven. God, that's our prayer today. That I want the life that you want for me. I want to have the plan and the purpose that you laid out for me. Because here's what I know. There's two books that you can live. You can either live his or you can live yours. But you can't live both at the same time. Anybody believe that to be true today? That God's plan, ultimately his purpose, the book that he's written for you, he has called you and I to get it out of heaven. And bring it to the earth. How do we get the invisible to be visible? Well, one thing that you and I have to realize is that you and I are God's agents on the earth. We've been sent. Matter of fact, we're not citizens of this world. The Bible says that we are citizens of heaven. How many of you know that we're just passing through this place? And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the day that I'm, I'm no longer just passing through that I finally arrived to my heavenly home. Anybody looking forward to that day? But while I'm here on the earth, I want to make a difference with my life. I want to do something that shakes the gates of hell. Anybody want to do that? If I got to charge hell with a water pistol, I'm okay because I just want to make a difference for the kingdom. And one way that you and I can do that is by saying, God, I want what you wrote about my life to be the case. I want to get all of it. I want to bring it all here. You know, Jesus even said it this way in Psalm 40, verse 7 and 8. He said, here I am, and I'm coming to you as a sacrifice for in the prophetic scrolls of your book you have written about me and I delight to fulfill your will O God for your living words are written upon the pages of my heart in other words Jesus realized that his life had already been planned out when he stepped foot on the earth he already knew that he would live only to die it had been written about him that was the 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 goal of his life was that he would give his life for you and for me. He knew that, and he said it in this particular verse. He says, hey, I want to accomplish your will and your way. And maybe you're sitting in this room today, and you say, that sounds really good, Pastor Kyle, but I'm not quite at that place where I want to fulfill the, the plan and the purpose of God for my life. I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now. I'm enjoying doing it my way. You know, I... I I understand where you're at because there was a season in my life where I, I enjoyed doing it my way. But can I be honest with you? The whole time I was doing it my way, I was empty. 
I was unfulfilled. I was angry. I was bitter. I had all kinds of things that I was battling because I was too busy trying to live out my plan rather than his plan. I came to tell somebody today, if you'll get on track with God, if you'll realize something's been written about your life long before it began, those things will begin to change for you. Jesus said, I come, I come to do your will. And your word has been written upon the pages of my heart. I want to teach you just for a moment if I can. When, when God reveals his will to you, what he first does is he plants something in your heart. Your, your heart is the seat of your passions. God plants passions deep down on the inside of you. Is there any passionate people in this room today? That God has planted some passions on the inside of you. I want to tell you three ways you can discern and define what the will of God is for your life. And it's simply this. The first question I would ask you is, what makes you angry? What makes you angry? You see, Moses, he grew up as a Hebrew, but he was raised as an Egyptian. His anger was aroused one day when he saw a Hebrew killing an Egyptian. An Egyptian killing a Hebrew, and he did not know why, but it was a snapshot of his calling. Why? Because Moses would be the very one to lead his people, the Hebrews, out of Egypt. This was a, a snapshot. This was an image. His anger was only a response to what God had already planted, that passion on the inside of his heart. What makes you angry? This month is National Anti-Human Trafficking Month. Maybe if you talk to Alicia Zayas, you would realize that what makes her angry is the, the wrongful enslavement of people. I wonder what makes you angry. What gives you a righteous, holy anger in the earth? Maybe for you it's something else. The second question I would say is this, is what makes you sad? What makes you cry? A mother was holding her dying daughter who was hit by a drunk driver. But after she had cried and after she had buried her daughter, she created an organization called MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. That she took her pain and she used it for good. I wonder what makes you cry and what makes you sad that God says, I put that in you because I wanted you to do something about it. Maybe you've got a heart for the homeless and that's your calling. Maybe you feel that that that's what God's calling you to do. Maybe you're drawn to help single, mo single mothers. I'm not sure what makes you cry, but the last question I would ask you is, what do you see? What do you see? See, a, a dentist could walk into this room and look at your teeth, and they get passionate. They get excited. Some of y'all are like, please don't look at mine, please. <laughs> a dentist could walk in and that's what they're passionate about. That's what they, that's what they see. See, a hairdresser uh, may be looking at my hair right now wanting to get a, a hold of it, <laughs> wanting to do something with, with my hair. A, a carpet person could come into this room, and they could see every run in the carpet that's in this building. Why? Because that's what they see. That's what they're good at. That's what they're passionate about. Now, the hairdresser would walk in and walk right over that carpet and never even see the run in the carpet. But she's looking at my hair saying, man, we got to do something with that thing. Why? Because that's, that's what she sees. Today, I believe that you and I can discern and define what the will of God is when we answer those three questions. What makes me angry? What makes me sad? And what do I see? Because it's those seat bed of the passions that God planted on the inside of your heart that is helping you define it. Listen, young person in this room, if you're asking God, what do you want to do in my life? What is your will? What is your purpose? Maybe you today could answer some of those questions. And here's what I know. Many of you say, well, I can't move until God reveals. Maybe God doesn't reveal until you start moving. Maybe God is saying, well, just put in the application for college, but I don't know what I'm going to study. Just file the application. Well, I'm enjoying living off of mom and dad, so I haven't put any job applications in. Some of you parents are like, that's my kid. But maybe you could start somewhere living out the book that was written for your life. And maybe God, this is what I know about God. Watch this. God doesn't reveal the whole plan all at once. Now, this is where I get frustrated with God, if I'm honest. 
God, I want the whole plan all at once. Just show the whole. Could you just open the book up and let me just look through it? But I believe if God allowed you and I to do that, we'd either do one of two things. We would either shut the book, praying some of it didn't happen, or we would avoid certain chapters altogether. But every part of your book matters. Every part of it today. Second thing I want to let you know this morning is this, is that your prayer life is the portal to understanding your purpose. Your prayer life opens the portal to God's purpose for your life. We're talking about prayer in this series. We're in the middle of 21 days of prayer. And I want to let you know today, if you want the plan of God for your life, you first got to get the, with the one who wrote the story. You know, my prayer for our church in these 21 days is that we would, be, we would pray more than we've ever prayed before. That our prayer life would go to another level in this year. Why? Because we don't need to hear from CNN. We don't need to hear from Fox News. We don't need to hear from Dr. Fauci. We don't need to hear from this person. I, I came to preach. Let me tell you something. What we need to hear from more than anything else is we need to hear from heaven. We need to hear from God. Somebody in this room came. Listen, we didn't come to come through the motions today. We came because we needed a word from God before we leave this place. I need to hear from you, God. And let me tell you something. It's in the times of you spending time with God, getting on your face in prayer, that God begins to reveal some things to you that only heaven has seen. Only heaven has heard. And so I'm telling you this this morning because maybe the thing that you could do in this season is just get alone with him. Maybe you say, well, that sounds really simple. But let me tell you something. It may be simple. This is what I know. Anytime that I spend in prayer, I've always got two voices going on. Maybe you're not like me and you might think I got multiple personality syndrome after I tell you this, but I'm going to let you know something. When I'm in prayer, when I'm spending time with God, I realize I got my voice. And I'm praying and I'm talking to God, getting things out. Then I've got the voice of God speaking back to me. But how many of you know there's a third voice? And that's the voice of your adversary. That's the voice of your accuser. Because oftentimes when I'm praying, when I'm talking to God, I'm hearing the enemy tell me why I don't deserve or why I don't, shouldn't uh, experience what it is that I'm praying about. That the enemy's trying to convince me that what I'm praying is a waste of time because God doesn't see me that way. God didn't plan that for me, that I don't deserve whatever that thing might be. But I want to let you know today that every time that you pray, you put your adversary on notice. Devil, you may say one thing, but there's been a book written about my life. No matter what it is that you say, I, I've got a book in heaven that's been written about me. And maybe today, we just need to serve notice on the enemy. To tell him, it's not you that governs my life. It's not you that has control of my life. Matter of fact, devil, you can go back to hell where you came from. And let me tell you something about my life. I realized that God said this in Jeremiah 1, 5. Before you, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. I had a plan for you. I had a purpose for you. And even though the enemy's coming up against me, I still got a plan. Anybody thankful God's got a plan? Even when things aren't going your way, even when things look bad, even when the enemy's up against you, God's still got a plan. And ultimately, you and I want to see and experience the plan and the purpose of God's life, but it takes us getting along with God. And some of you right now are saying, I don't know how this is going to end. I don't know how, what I'm going to do about my, my son. I don't know how I'm going to manage my finances. And God's saying, I know. Why? Because I got a book with your name on it. There's a lot in life that we don't know, but there is one thing that we can know, and that's in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And this is a verse that many Christians memorize this verse just after they've memorized John chapter 3, 16. John Piper even said this about Romans 8. He said that this might be the greatest chapter in all the Bible. 
And in this particular verse, it says this, and we know. Somebody say, we know. And we know that all in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, that's a great verse that many of us have memorized, but oftentimes what we do is we use that verse as mayonnaise and mustard over all the bad things that have happened in our life. But there's more to the story. Matter of fact, in verse 29, it says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Next verse. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. I want to let you know that there's a book with your name on it in heaven, and there's five things that today can tell you how much God loves you and the fact that he will work all things for your good. Number one is this, he foreknew me. He foreknew me. God thought about me long before I existed. And he designed a purpose and potential for my life. He predestined me. In other words, he predetermined some things about my life. He, he laid out a plan, a road map of his Thoughts. Matter of fact, Psalm 37, verse 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He predetermined some things. Thirdly, he called me. I love this one because I want, it says he called me. I didn't call myself. And I want to let you know something. For a long time, many people believe, well, only ministers are called. Can I let you know something? If I'm going to be called, you're going to be called. You may not be called to doing what I'm doing, but I may not be called to doing what you're doing, but nonetheless, we're all called. We all got a purpose. We all got a plan that we got to walk out. And I want to let you know something today that when God calls you, it's because he wants you. He doesn't consult your failures. He doesn't con consult your mistakes when he decides to call you. Matter of fact, he's only concerned with your future. This is what I know. Some people may be on the outside of your life looking at you right now, and if you were to walk in the room and say, I'm, I've been called. I've been called by God. And they might look at you and say, you don't look like much right now. And I, For so long, I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but there have been moments in my life where I felt disqualified. I felt like I've been counted out. You've been called? Can I tell you something today? You may not look like much right now, but I wonder where God's getting ready to take you. I wonder where God has called you to. I wonder what he's called you to do that one day people are going to look back in amazement and say, I never thought that little kid could do that. I never thought that oh, that lady could do that. I never thought he or she would end up doing that. But when I, can I let you know something today? You and I have been called in spite of all those things. We can rest assured that the calling of God is on our life. Number four, he justified me. He justified me. It was his righteousness that he traded for my sin and for your sin. Maybe today you feel like you're far from God. I want to let you know something that you may feel far from him, but he's close to you. And he wants to take your sin and he said, I'll take that and in exchange, I'll give you righteousness. I'll take what's wrong with you and I'll give you everything that's right about me. That's justification. But then lastly, number five, he glorified me. Now I love this one because how many of you know that when we step four foot in heaven one day, the Bible says we're going to get a glorified body. Somebody with a bad foot just said, thank you, Jesus. I'm getting a glorified body. I'm getting a new body. I'm, I'm, I'm going to experience what glory really really is but because of these things we know that God works all things together for the good of those that love him but sometimes it's not always good wouldn't you agree that everything's not always fun in our story. Everything's not always perfect. And we think sometimes because of these verses that we just read that, well, everything in God's plan and everything in my book should be good. 
But I've found out in this life that just because it isn't good doesn't mean it isn't God. Sometimes God allows us to go through some things so that he can get some things through us. That God will allow you and me to walk through difficulty so that we can experience the goodness on the other side. Let me tell you something. You cannot be excited about your victory until you have had some things not go well for you. But when you've walked through difficult seasons, and some of you are there right now, some of you are walking through something that's bigger than you, you are facing something that, that, that's staring you in the face, and it looks like you won't get through it. But can I tell you something? When you get on the other side, it'll make you thank God for the victory that he's already promised you. Does anybody believe that today, that it's worth going through even the bad stuff? In 2 Kings chapter 4, there's a story about a woman. The Bible calls her a Shunammite woman. She was a woman from Shunam, and she goes to her husband one day, and she says, I want us to add a room in the house. Let's go on the roof. Let's add a room. I'll go to Ikea. I'll spend just a little bit of money, and we're going to furnish this thing. And I want to set up for the man of God. The prophet Elisha would often come through, and he would enjoy a meal with this particular family. But when he comes, I want him to have a place of his own. And so she built the room, and the man of God goes up to the room one day just to get some rest, and he begins to think. He says, this woman and this family have done so much for me. What can we do for her? And so he sends his servant, Gehazi. He says, go and ask the woman, what can be done for you? What do you want? She comes up, and she says, hey, it is well. We're good. I don't need anything. But what the prophet Elisha knew about this particular woman is that she had been unable to bear a child. She had been praying. She had been believing. She had been trying to have a kid, and she couldn't get pregnant. And the Lord told Elisha, Elisha told her, not too long from now, you're going to bear a son. And so she has a kid. She has a kid, and that's the story. But if you know this story, you know that there's more to the story. Because we could stop right there, and that's a miraculous thing where we say, she got the kid that she had been believing for, she had been praying for, and we can rejoice. But there's something that happens just after this, not too long after, as the kid had grown up. One day he gets this headache, and he dies. So she takes him up to the room, and she lays him on the bed that the man of God had been sleeping on, and she leaves him there. She shuts the door. And that could be the end of the story, but can I let you know that she didn't stop there. Matter of fact, she went to the man of God herself. She said, where's that man that told me about this kid? He's, matter of fact, he's the one that caused all this. She didn't ask her husband to go. She went by herself. She said, man of God, Elisha, my son that you promised me, he's, he just died. I, I need you to come. And I don't need you to speak a word or, or give me your stick. No, I need you yourself to get here. And so the prophet Elisha goes to the house. And if you know the story, the Bible says that he ends up laying on the boy. <sighs> Something powerful, transferable happens. And the Bible says that what ends up happening is he sneezes seven times. He comes back to life. Why? Because eight is the number of new beginnings. I believe something significant happens in this particular story because God raises up the dead son. And that could be the end of the story. And for years I thought that's the end of the story. But I noticed something just this week as I was preparing for this message in chapter 8 of 2 Kings. Because... The prophet Elisha looks at the woman and says, there's going to be a seven-year famine. You need to get your stuff, and you need to get out of where you are. So she leaves. But at the end of those seven years, she's ready to go back home. She's ready to get her stuff. And something happens in 2 Kings chapter 8. Let's look at it together. It says, at the end of the seven years, she came back from the land of the Philistines and went to appeal to the king for her house and land. And the king was talking to Gehazi, remember, this is the servant of the man of God, and has said, Tell me about all the great things Elisha has done. And just as Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead 
to life. Let me just stop right here for a moment and let you know that they couldn't say this if the boy had never died. And some things in your life may die, but how many of you know you can't have a resurrection without a crucifixion? You, you got to realize some things may die, but God can raise those things back up. Anybody got a dream that maybe has died, that God's getting ready to resurrect something in this room today? It says, the woman whose son Elisha brought back to life came to appeal to the king for her house and land. And Gehazi said, this is the woman. This is the one I told you about. My Lord, the king, and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. And the king asked the woman about it, and she told him. I love how another version says it. It says that she told him the story. And then he assigned an official to her case and said to him, Give back everything that belonged to her, including all the income from her land from the day she left the country until now. Let me tell you something. God's not just getting ready to bless you with a little bit. The Bible says that God is El Shaddai. He is the God of more than enough. Let me tell you something. She didn't just get her stuff back. She got all the income during the time that she had been gone. Time she didn't work. She didn't have to work for it. She didn't have to strive for it. She didn't have to do anything. Matter of fact, because the king saw the miracle that the boy had been dead and now he was alive, he said, I want you to get an official and you give her back everything that belongs to her, even what she missed out on for seven years. How many of you know that God's getting ready to do something in your life? And even though the enemy has tried to take everything from you, listen to me, God's getting ready to bless somebody in this room today. God's got something for you. Why? Because there's a book with your name on it. He knew that this woman would go through a famine, but he also knew that he would give it back to her, pressed down, shaken together, running over. She wouldn't have room enough to contain it. You're like, why are you shouting? Why? Because I'm excited. Because this is what I know. Listen to me. If God did it for the Shunammite woman, I know he'll do it for you. I know he'll do it for me. And I don't know if you've lost anybody during the last two years, but can I tell you something? Loss is not an easy thing, and this woman knew full well, but can I tell you something? That everything that take God takes from us, he always replaces it with something else. You say, well, God could never replace that person, and you're exactly right, but what he can do is he can replace mourning for joy. And today, I want to let you know something. That there's, there's three parts of our life. There's the ugly. Somebody say the ugly. The bad. I wonder if you know what the next one is. And the good. I know I'm over time, but that's okay. Can I tell you something? This is what I found out about God, and I want to give you my last three points if you're taking notes. Simply this. Number one, don't get stuck in the scene. Don't get stuck in the scene. Because some of you right now, you feel like your story is over because you're walking through a difficult season or a difficult time. But God just told me and sent me to encourage you to let you know this is just a scene. This is just a chapter. And what I know is there's many more chapters after this one. Is there anybody that you'd be honest enough to say that's where I'm at right now? Come on, wave at me if that's you. I'm walking through some ugly, bad stuff right now, and I, I just, I'm barely hanging on, but can I let you know today, if you'll hang on, it might not be good right now, but it eventually will be. Why? Because he works all things together for the good. Don't get stuck in a scene, but then number two is don't skip the scene. There's nothing that I dislike more when I'm watching a movie with somebody than for them to skip a scene. I got to see the whole movie to understand the plot and what's going to happen. And don't, for all you spoilers out there, by the way, don't try to watch something with me because I want to see everything that happens along the way. Why? Because if you skip a scene, you miss that part of the story. And can I let you know that skippers don't get anything out of the chapter that they're currently in if they just decide to try to skip it. Man, this is why I know that. Skippers get nothing but 
This is luggage. You know that. There's nothing in here, but metaphorically, there's something in this scene of your life that God wants you to have. In every scene of your life, God's trying to do something in you and through you. In every scene of your life. So if you skip a scene, then you don't get that part of what God had for you during that. But if you say, God, I'm not going to skip the scene. I'm not going to skip the chapter because I realize that there's something in there that you want me to have. There's something in there that you want me to possess. I'm not going to skip the scene. I met a lady yesterday named Teresa. We were out doing homeless outreach in Visalia and Tulare, and we went to give her some things that we had prepared, and we were praying with her and talking with her, and I was so amazed when we asked how we could pray for her because she mentioned her son and her daughter and her other son, and I noticed she didn't mention herself. And I thought, hmm, you're homeless. You're out here. You're ostracized. And then she began to talk about herself. She began to talk about things that she was going through and what she was dealing with. But I love the fact that she said this one thing. She said, I know I'm out here right now. She said, but I won't always be out here. She said, this is just, oh, listen to me. I knew I was getting ready to preach this sermon this morning. So when she said this, it was like a light bulb went off because she said, this is just a chapter in my book. This is not the end. I might be homeless right now, but I know God's got a house for me up in my future. And if I'll just keep looking ahead, if I won't give up when things get ugly or when things get bad, let me tell you something. Don't skip this scene. Why? Because God's got something in this scene that he wants to get in you. The last one is simply this. You've got to gain strength in your story. Gain strength in your story. There's a song out right now. And a lot of people use it on their Instagram and that kind of thing when they're putting together videos. And it says, this one line in the song, it says, can we skip to the good part? Can we skip to the good part? And I believe many of you are asking that question this morning. You're like, I realize there's a book written about my life. I realize that God foreknew me. He predestined me. He called me. He justified me. He glorified me. But could we just get to the good part already? I wonder what God's trying to do in this season that you're trying to bypass. Because let me tell you something. You're going to need it once you do get to the good part. This is what happens. God takes all things. Somebody say all things. Malfunction. He takes all things. Wait a minute. I know the devil's trying to give me a hard time with this illustration because he don't want me to get what's in this chapter. I know it ain't pretty, but it's going to make sense in a minute. Somebody say, can we get to the good part? Man, let me tell you something. God's going to take the ugly things that I've been through in my life. He's going to take all the bad stuff, but this is what I know. Ooh, watch this, y'all. He works all things together for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. I wonder if anybody's ready to get to the good part, because when you get to the good part, let me tell you something. God's going to do something that's going to blow your mind. Woo. That wore me out. I'm going to be honest with y'all. I need to go to the gym. Where's X Factor Fitness? I got to get in the gym. (laughs) Today, you may be asking that question. As I get ready to close, can we skip to the good part? God, can we just, just like the Shunammite woman, watched her son die and watched him be raised to life. 
I believe that that's exactly what God wants to do in this room today. I sense it. As I was praying about this weekend, I said, God, there's people walking through some very difficult seasons and times in their life right now. And they need you to show up. They need you to come through. They need to see the good part. But can I tell you something? Paul said this. He said, whether I'm abound or I'm abased, rich, poor, good, bad, Listen to this. He said, I have learned to be content. In all things, God works all things. In all things, I have learned to be content. I want to let you know that you can have contentment even when everything's not going your way. That you can be fulfilled, that you can be satisfied, that you can find some good even when everything isn't good. And today I want to pray for those of you this morning that maybe you are feeling that tug in your life right now and you're ready to experience all that God has in your book. Let me tell you something. There's some people in this room, I said every one of us are called, but I know this today. There's some of you that have yet to step into your calling. You've yet to step into your purpose. Some of you feel like it's too late. But as I was watching baptisms this morning, I was reminded that when they got down in that water, imagine this with me, all the ugly, all the bad, all the dirty, all the sin, all the mistakes went down in that water. And when they come back up out of that water, I could see that nothing but good was clothing them. Nothing but God's glory was clothing them. I want to let you know something today. You may feel like it's too late, but it's never too late. With God, all things are possible. Would you stand with me all over this room this morning? With your head bowed, your eyes closed right now. If you're in this room, and after hearing this message, maybe God's been talking to you, drawing you, pulling you towards himself. And God is simply saying this. If you'll give your life to me, I can reveal and help you walk into the good life. Not the perfect life, but a good life. That when you walk through difficulty, you'll never walk through it by yourself. Holy Spirit, would you speak to people all over this room right now that need a relationship with you? And if that's you, we're going to pray a prayer together as a family, church family today, and we want you just to say this out loud with us. Would you do that? Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. From this day forward, I'm all yours. You died for me. I want to live for you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Show me what to do in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Can we give God a hand clap of praise for those that just prayed that prayer? Come on, let's celebrate. We celebrate you, Jesus.